Good afternoon. My name is Carrie McDermott. I'm just waiting till our attendees um, are able to join our live session. All right, good afternoon, welcome. You have joined uh, the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network webinar titled Putting Infection Control into Everyday Practice. I'd like to thank you for joining and, um, and I'd like to just welcome you and go over a few opening comments and introductory um, tips for today's webinar. First, this webinar is hosted by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network. We are the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quinn QIO for North and South Dakota. And we're here today in partnership with the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care and Project First Line. Again, my name is Carrie McDermott and I am the Communications Director for Great Plains Quinn. Thanks again for joining us today. A uh, few housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar and it will be added to the Great Plains Quinn website within one to two business days. All lines are muted throughout today's session. Uh, we will open up for Q&A at the end of the session if time allows. Um, questions and comments throughout the session can be added to the questions panel on your GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, you can see it on the right-hand side of your screen um, under the tab that says questions. If at any point you have questions for our speaker today, please add it in there. And if time allows, at the end of the session, we will um, present questions to um, Sherry Fast. Uh, we have added Sherry's presentation to the handouts tab of this um, webinar. Again, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a handouts um, option, and I included a PDF of her presentation if that's helpful. Again, thank you for joining. This webinar aims to emphasize the importance of adhering to the basics of environmental cleaning and disinfection to promote patient and resident safety, staff wellness, and reduce healthcare acquired infections. The content is geared for environmental service workers, certified nurse aides, and nurses in long-term care, hospitals, and outpatient settings and clinics. We hosted a seminar in December um, titled, uh, Cleaning is More Than a Swiffer and Mr. Clean, um, also offered by uh, Sherry Fast and Project First Line. And I'll put the link to that recording in the chat um, feature as soon as I'm done introducing um, Sherry today. Uh, again, we are fortunate to have Project First Line um, in South Dakota's project lead, Sherry Fast, um, with us today to share her knowledge and expertise with us. She is also the program manager with the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care. Sherry has over 30 years of experience working in healthcare. Uh, she's leading South Dakota's Project First Line um, initiative which is a national infection prevention and awareness initiative sponsored by the CDC. Sherry has worked with facilities, healthcare providers, community leaders, and patients on multiple healthcare initiatives, including antibiotic stewardship. She recently obtained her certification in infection control and is anxious to work with facilities and frontline healthcare workers on infection prevention measures to keep us all safe. She has also received her certification in case management and wound care. She played a pivotal role in the development of a national home health infection prevention toolkit and was selected to serve as a technical reviewer for the national organization. She has taught numerous diabetes education classes and is currently a master trainer for Better Choices, Better Health in Diabetes, Chronic Disease Management, and Pain. She has worked as a quality risk manager and infection control nurse and has also completed the AgriSafe Nurse Scholar class in 2019 and was selected to serve as South Dakota's Total Farmer Health Coach, which promotes health and wellness to South Dakota agricultural producers. I will now turn today's presentation over to Sherry um, to share with us. Go ahead, Sherry. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Well, thank you, Carrie, for the nice introduction. Uh, I hope that everyone is staying warm today. It's pretty cold here in South Dakota. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, so we're just going to dive right in. Our objectives today are to review the chain of transmission and strategies to break this chain, 
We will look at the mode of transmission of infections. We will talk about standard and transmission-based precautions and the differences of those. And then we're also going to talk about um, how we can reduce infection in while we provide care. I think that is so important and so we need to be able to do that. So with that, let's get started. So really, um, I guess before I get started, I wanna thank everyone for joining. I wanna uh, make sure that you, know, you took time out of your busy day to learn about infection control and measures that we can take. I wanna say thank you a hundred times over for the work that you do working on these crazy times and on the front line. And then also thank the Great Plains Quinn for hosting the webinar. So really the goal for any infection prevention program is to minimize the risk of infection in patients and residents. We want to reduce the risk of transmission of infectious agents between residents, patients, and healthcare workers. And then we wanna reduce infections related to the use of different devices that we have. So our first objective is to review the chain of infection and we're going to talk about the strategies to reduce this. So for infections to be able to transfer, we need three things. We need a reservoir or a source. We need a susceptible host with a portal of entry. And then we need a mode of transmission. So how is it getting to where it needs to go? So bear with me in this next slide here as we talk about the links in the infection control um, that we've all seen and heard about in healthcare. So each link stands for something or someone that helps pass on an infection. Stage one is that microorganism that causes the infection. So this can be a virus, a bacteria, a parasite. Microorganisms that cause infection are called pathogens. So if there is no pathogen, there is no infection. Stage two is our reservoir. So this is where that organism lives. The human body um, is, a path, is a reservoir for many different types of pathogens, but they can also live in equipment, they can live in plants and soil, water, animals, and they can also live in the environment. Stage three is our exit reservoir. So this is the way the organism leaves the reservoir. Um, the body has many different exit points, which are openings or breaks in the skin, such as tears or wounds. They could also be from an opening made in surgery. Um, another example of this is when a person coughs or sneezes, that exit from, is from the lungs. So think about that. Microorganisms can leave um, the bladder in the via the urine. So just some ways that we don't normally think of how things get out of our body. Stage four is the organisms are transmitted or transported from that port to the entry of another person. Um, this can happen through direct or indirect contact or through airborne transmission. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about airborne transmission in a few slides. Stage five, that is that portal of entry is that natural opening in the body. For example, a susceptible host may breathe in a microorganism through their mouth or nose when a person coughs or sneezes. This could also be, like we said before, an open wound, a skin tear, a pressure ulcer, uh, microorganisms that cause diarrhea um, enter the susceptible person's host through their digestive tract. Um, maybe somebody didn't wash their hands when they were preparing food. So that would be another way. And then stage six is we need a susceptible host. And we are all susceptible to infections caused by viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi, any pathogen. We are all susceptible host. An example of this is when a person with a respiratory disease um, may be more susceptible to an inhaled pathogen. So something in the air. Um, other people with increased risk are those that are undergoing chemotherapy. Maybe they're on steroids. Anybody that has a break in their skin, 
anybody that has a device like a Foley catheter, maybe it's a PIC line, maybe it's a CVL line, um, it could be an unclean environment, or simply our age. So maybe the elderly or the very young. All of those are uh, susceptible hosts, as we all are. So how can you break the chain of infection? Well, we can all do this by doing some very simple yet proven techniques. We can wear gloves. We can make sure our rooms are clean. We can properly clean surfaces, so countertops, um, tables. <clears throat> um, I gotta take a swallow of water here. My voice hopefully will make it here. We can use proper technique in inserting medical devices in how we care for those medical devices and then also how we remove them. Part of that goes along with getting those devices out as soon as possible. We don't wanna leave those in any longer than we have to. Using a barrier, uh, staying up to date with education and getting vaccinated, using appropriate PPEs, and then most importantly, I think, is using hand hygiene. If you are unsure if you should wash your hands, you should wash your hands. And then we wanna make sure that we ensure that our residents and our patients are being well cared for. So we wanna make sure that we do good personal hygiene. Peri care is so very important. Covering wounds, using the right type of isolation when needed. Uh, we wanna make sure that we use antibiotics appropriate, appropriately. So antibiotics, as we all know, they're life-saving medications, but we don't wanna use them unnecessarily and only for the recommended um, duration. I hope that everybody has an antibiotic stewardship program in place. And if you don't, we need to help you get started with one. You can reach out to me or um, Kip Stahl at the, uh, the Department of Health. We would all, anybody would be glad to help you get started with this. It's also a new regulation to have an antibiotic stewardship program. So please, um, it's not that hard to get it started. We just have to start. Hand hygiene is equally important for our patients and residents. Make sure they are washing their hands after they use the bathroom, um, after they eat. Don't even ask them if they want to wash their hands. Just say it's time to hand, time to wash our hands and hand them a wash rag. We want to use single rooms if we can. I know not all long-term care has that um, ability to do that. And we oftentimes have older facilities, but if we can use single rooms, um, that would be ideal. We want to make sure that our patients are staying hydrated. This helps our skin stay healthy to avoid cuts and breaks in the skin. It, along with that, it helps keep our uh, urinary system flushed out, prevents UTIs from happening. It helps our digestive system. Um, we avoid constipation when we stay hydrated. We certainly don't want to share personal care items. Um, this goes for us at home as well. Think about sharing razors or combs and brushes, washcloths and towels. I think of um, at home, if you have several girls at home and they share makeup and they share, um, you know, soap and those kinds of things, everybody needs to have their own supplies. Our objective two, we're going to talk about the mode of transmission. So how do infections get from one place to the other? And we have a polling question. So Carrie's going to put that in. Um, I will read it as Carrie puts it in and then feel free to just Type in your answer. So coughing, sneezing, and talking are best associated with what form of transmission? Is it airborne, direct contact, droplet transmission, or indirect transmission? So we'll give you a couple minutes just to put your answers in. Gary, the polls are still coming in, so I'm going to leave it open for about another 10 seconds. <clears throat> So 
So as you guys keep, continue to put those in, um, we'll answer this question here in a minute. Carrie, can you tell me what are our responses? Do you see that? Do you see that results now, Sherry? Uh -uh. No, I don't. Oh, I apologize. Okay, so airborne transmission was at 32%, droplet transmissions at 68%, and then direct contact and indirect transmission are at zero percent. Okay. So those of you that picked droplet transmission would be correct. So we're gonna keep going and we'll get into this a little more detail here. Okay, so the mode of transmission. So how are diseases um, spread? So first of all, we have contact transmission. So this is when a person is exposed to an infectious agent from direct contact, with infectious blood or body substances. So that can be blood, urine, feces, could be saliva, nasal secretions, or it can be from an indirect object um, that is contaminated. So maybe we have door handles, light switches, elevator buttons, um, countertops, handrails. So anything like that, um, maybe it's even a cutting board if you work in the dietary department. Droplet transmission, that is when infectious agents are contained in large droplets, such as a splash, a spray, a spatter of blood or body substances, and they're deposited into our mucous membranes. And that usually is on the eyes, nose, and mouth. Then we have airborne transmission, which we t sometimes think of a cough as an airborne transmission, but a cough is a large droplet so it lands relatively quickly on a surface so that is when airborne is when an infectious agent is contained in aerosols and dust are inhaled we also have a foodborne transmission so that's um, eating contaminated food we have waterborne so that is when maybe you drink uh, contaminated water and then we also have vector borne transmission and so mosquitoes and ticks um, are little bugs that cause bites those are vector board so we went through that relatively quickly but i like to get into um, some of these other things here and spend a little more time with that so our third objective is to talk about the difference between standard and transmission-based precautions so many people don't understand these differences and Lori is going to put into chat, I believe, a link um, from the CDC that talks about isolation precautions. So you can go check that out for any questions you have. And although much attention over the last few years has focused on these principles, um, we still need to educate and we still need to review because people still do not understand it. So standard precautions are infection prevention practices that apply to all patients, all patients, regardless of whether they are suspected or confirmed with any infection, all patients, doesn't matter. And then transmission-based precautions, are they're more in detail. So they depend on what that patient is suspected of having or diagnosed with or colonized with. So a little more detail goes into transmission-based precautions. So now we're gonna get into a little more with standard precautions and review that. <clears throat> standard precautions combine those major features of what used to be called universal precautions. Um, it is based on the assumption that all blood, body fluids, secretions, excretions, non-intact skin, and mucous membranes may contain transmittable agents. Standard precautions consist of hand hygiene, gowns, gloves, a face shield, eye protection, and now they have added safe injection practices to that. The type of activity or task determines the amount and the type of PPE to be used. The greater the risk of coming in contact or being splashed with a patient's blood or body fluids determines what kind of PPE you want to use and how much of that you need to use. I thought it might be helpful to talk about examples of tasks when you should wear PPE. 
So procedures such as suctioning, um, irrigating a wound or cleaning contaminated wounds, those are types of things that always get standard precautions. We never want to wash our gloved hands. We never want to reuse disposable gloves. There are some talk about double gloving, giving you extra precaution or protection, and we really discourage double gloving um, in most circumstances. It makes us a little sloppier. We tend to um, not wash our hands as well. So double gloving is not recommended in many situations. If you are doing more than one procedure on the same patient, you need to make sure you're changing gloves after each procedure and wash your hands in between. Many times facilities get cited from surveyors because of not changing gloves. Don't be that facility. Um, we need to remember that not doing hand hygiene is still the number one way that infections are transmitted. And it, that is simply because germs and bacteria are everywhere. So I can't stress um, that enough. Make sure that you are changing your gloves in between procedures, even if it's the same patient. A little bit more on standard precautions. Um, we want to dispose of our gowns and gloves after use in the general uh, waste container, so in the garbage, in the room. We don't want to take that off in the hallway. Um, not, not acceptable to take it off in the hallway. Don't take your mask and lay it on the nurse's station. They have to be removed inside that patient's room. Some situations in which to wear a gown, again, irrigating a wound, uh, maybe you're doing tracheostomy cares, anytime that you think blood or any kind of body fluid will be spilling or dripping on your clothes. Now we're gonna talk about transmission-based precautions. And transmi transmission-based precautions, as we talked about, these get a little more in depth and they involve a few more steps. So we have contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. So now we're gonna talk about these, and these are all used in addition to standard-based precautions. So you do standard for everybody, and then we drill it down even farther. <clears throat> so this is an example of um, contact transmission, and this is when blood or body substance from a person or animal comes in contact with another person in a way that it can um, directly enter that body. So to help you understand this, I am always one to like personal stories. And so I am going to share a personal story in my family. This is a picture of my daughter and she has given me permission to use this and talk about it in hopes that somebody else could um, avoid having to do it, deal with this. So when she was in high school, um, and she's older now, she's 30, she was playing basketball and she got scratched in the eye um, from another gal's fingernails while they were playing ball. So after the game, her eye swelled up and um, that's when we found she had the scratch cornea. She, we got treatment for it, but it continued to get worse. And over the next several days, we had um, hospitalization and IV antibiotics and all the works. Uh, we did get it cultured and the culture grew herpes. Uh, thinking that that was done and over after we got that treated. Well, ever since then, every year, at least once a year, she has an outbreak of this. And it is strictly because that gal had herpes under her fingernail, scratched her cornea, and now she has, she gets this, like I said, all the time. So it looks like it might be a different eye, but it's just she took pictures herself with her phone and turned it around. So it always is the same eye. Usually it comes in the outer canthus of her eye, but this last episode um, was more on her cheekbone. So that first picture is probably two years ago, and you can see she woke up and she just eyes swollen and we thought, oh great. Well, this next series of pictures is just from a few weeks ago. She woke up and she had these little vesicles under her eye. You can see them there. Day two, a little more swollen. Her eye is actually a lot more swollen. Day three is that fourth picture there. 
She's starting to get some scabs. The redness is really starting to show up. Eye is almost closed shut. And actually it was at that day that her mouth even was um, pulled up and she said it felt like her contact wanted to just pop out. She wasn't able to wear her glasses because her swelling was so much on her cheek that she couldn't get her glasses on as well. So those are just some pictures. So after about five days, the swelling finally did start to go down again. But um, just wanted to share that sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So she continues to have repeated bouts of this. Um, culture is always growing herpes. Um, other examples of direct contact may be getting a needle stick. That's direct needle to your skin. Um, maybe a disease that's passed on from a mom to a new baby. Um, maybe it's passing saliva, or it might be a mosquito bite. Right now, you know, um, saliva and, and those kinds of things I think about, we have a rise in STDs, and so um, think about that. So it could even be mosquito bite. So I hope that um, helps you understand how easy that can happen. And it has lasting effects. <clears throat> so indirect transmission, that is when germs from an infected host or another source are passed, passively transmitted to another person via, via an object, so a non-living object. And those can be surfaces, keyboards, iPads, utensils, cups, anything like that um, are ways that um, infection can be by indirect transmission. And that list really goes on and on. So some things with contact-based precautions, whether it's indirect or direct. So these are used for infections, um, germs, or diseases that are caused by spread or touching patient or items in their room. So this could be MRSA, it could be uh, VRE, any diarrheal illnesses are easily passed on, open wounds, RSV, C. difficile, some things as staff that you need to know is you need to gown and glove upon entry into the room, discard the PPE before leaving the room. Um, we talked about, <clears throat> you know, if you're doing two procedures, make sure you change. But also if you're transferring that patient out of the room, um, you know, you need to put new P PPE on. If you can use a single room, that would be nice. Um, that is the best choice. If by some reason you can't have a single room for patients, you can um, have two people with the same diagnosis share a room, but it's not ideal and we don't want that unless it's all pot, unless you have to do that. Um, the room should be cleaned daily with a focus on high touch surfaces. And then if it is C. difficile, you'll want a one to 10 solution of bleach. I love this slide on here. Every act, every person, every action, every day. That's how we make a difference. Now we'll talk about droplet precautions. These are used for um, large droplets, um, much like our polling question was coughing and sneezing. So examples of this, and some you would want to use droplet precautions for a patient that came in with influenza someone that had whooping cough or pertussis, which actually is still around, or bacterial meningitis, also on uh, somebody with RSV. And you'll notice RSV was on contact as well. People can be on more than one type of isolation, as we know. So we want to make sure we use a surgical mask, um, single rooms again if we can. Um, if you do have to share a room, um, the beds need to be at least six feet apart. Use that privacy curtain, change your gloves, and wash your hands between patients, and then daily clean of high touch um, and horizontal surfaces, meaning the countertops and things like that. So we're going to talk about airborne transmission here. And this picture sure, clearly shows how a sneeze will impact people and surfaces. That is why. Um, Sneeze and cough etiquette are very important. Make sure our patients know cough etiquette. Um, it's kind of like, um, like a smoke particle. If you can smell it and you can inhale it, that's kind of what I like to think of. We won't see all of this bacteria, but so large particles can carry viruses and bacteria through the air 
and then deposit it on mucous membrane. So the eyes, the nose, the mouth of a susceptible person. So don't travel long distances um, and you need three feet of separation. Examples of this would be whooping cough, rubella, mumps, influenza again, um, those are droplets. And then smaller particles are the aerosols that are airborne. And they can be deposited, again, in our mucous membranes or they are inhaled. So they're smaller and they can be infective over time. Examples of this would be tuberculosis, um, Legionella, chickenpox, and measles. Some ex things to do with airborne precautions. Um, they're used to prevent transmission of those organisms that remain suspended in the air and they travel great distances due to their small size. The concern for transmission of these pathogens in healthcare settings is not typically from face-to-face -face contact, but rather the airflow patterns within the facilities. So patients um, should be in a negative pressure room with at least six to 12 air exchanges per hour, and that needs to be exhausted outside. Uh, let's see, we need to daily check and make sure that that air pressure is maintained should keep the door shut at all times. <clears throat> Healthcare workers, um, if you have airborne precautions, they need to wear at least an N95 or higher level mask, um, especially if you suspect that person to have TB or if the patient is undergoing a procedure where those lesions may be aerialized, I can't say that word. Um, so like a wound irrigation or a whir whirlpool treatment, uh, infectious particles may be aerosolized if doing an endotracheal intubation. So question, um, would you use extra precautions if the patient was vomiting or having lots of stooling? That answer would be yes, again, because those particles can be in the air and then if you breathe in, you swallow those. And so that is how that is transmitted. Wanna talk about um, chicken pox here and just know that if you have a patient that calls and they're in the waiting room and they say um, oh my little girl woke up with some spots and I'm not sure what it is I think I need to bring her in be thinking chicken pox and don't let them sit out in the lobby for a long period of time those are highly um, contagious and they need to be in airborne precautions um, Let's see, I think I kind of went through this already. Pregnant um, healthcare workers should not work with um, airborne precautions, so those TB patients. This is a video we were going to show, but to lack of time, I don't think we'll have time. I just encourage you to um, go to this link and watch. This is a very good, a description and video on what a respiratory droplet is, why it matters. Um, this is from Project First Line. It's only about five minutes long, so I really encourage you to go watch this. And I'll give you the link to our South Dakota Project First Line webpage here at the end of the presentation. So, and Sherry, this is Carrie. I'll add a link to that video um, in the post email that I send to all um, registrants. Okay. So we have another um, polling question now, and this is, when is the best time to clean your overbed table? Would it be the last thing that you clean when you go in a room? Would it be the first thing because it's the dirtiest? Whenever you think of it or somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> For some of you that um, were on the December webinar, you might, some of these questions that we're gonna talk about now might be familiar to you, but I think that they're worth repeating and you might pick something up this time that you didn't pick up before. I have a few new things, but um, worth repeating. So Carrie, did you or open that up? I'm sorry, you can't see that. It's in progress and we've got people voting right now. Um, I do think once I close it and um, show it, I think our attendees can see the responses. Carrie, I'm sorry, you can't, but I'll um, share them with you. We're still getting votes in, so I'll give it another 10 seconds and then I'll close it out. You're still coming up. So, uh, 
I'll close it in five. All right, close it. And then I'm going to share the results and I'll and I'll share them with you, Sherry, since you can't see them. Ooh, it's a it's a tie for the first two responses. Uh, last thing in the room at 42 percent. First, because it is usually the dirtiest, also at 42 percent. Whenever I think of it at 5% and somewhere in the middle at 12%. Okay, well, great. Well, the answer is the last thing in the room, so it's number one. And we'll go over that here as we go along in the next several slides. So whenever you're going to go clean and in any infection control um, thing that you're doing, you want to make sure that you, or procedure that you're doing, make sure that you're collecting your materials that you need. So you need to think about that. How many times, that seems like a relatively easy thing, like, okay, I'm going to get everything I need and go in. How many times do we actually forget something and we have to go back out? So it seems simple, but very important. So think about everything that you're going to need when you go in to do a procedure or clean. So we want to remember clean to dirty, top to bottom. And I will preach this over and over um, till you remember it. So environmental cleaning is part of standard precautions, which should be applied to healthcare facilities, any, any kind of environment that you're working. So it's important for everyone to know the best practices when it comes to cleaning and disinfection to protect us all. Um, a lot of what we'll talk about now in these next slides are basic re review, but we do forget, we get busy, and so I think they are worth repeating. This is an example of a cleaning strategy going from cleanest to dirtiest. In other words, start cleaning with the items that are commonly touched outside of that patient zone before moving to the high touch surfaces. So outside walls should be done before our bed before our overbed table because we don't want to take those dirty germs and spread them throughout the room and so if you're not doing this this technique i encourage you to change that relook at your policies out clean to dirty top to bottom so that overbed table is most likely touched numerous times so we want to clean that towards the end of your room clean um, some facilities also, you should also do the bathrooms last if you at all can. Some facilities um, do do the bathroom first and then they have to change out all their water, all everything because of the way their rooms are set up. But you um, cannot use the same water that you clean the bathroom with to do the floors in the rooms. This is another example of cleaning schedules um, and procedures. Um, I know that many facilities do not have an organized or systematic way in which they clean. Really need to rethink that. It is highly recommended that this be done. Um, if I came to observe and I watched three people do some cleaning, they should all have basically the same routine. Again, outside of the room, work your way to the, to the bed and over bed sta um, stand. As an example, if you have cleaning the bed rails before the bed legs, top to bottom. You wanna clean the surface of areas like your countertops before you do your floors. And why would that? Because things can fall to the floor. Seems like common sense, but not done very often. When we um, had our webinar in um, December, this um, was a, a slide that people didn't know about, so I thought it was worth repeating as well. If you use a, a rag, a cleaning rag, you need to fold it um, until you get eight sides on your cloth. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly here. So we wanna wet your cloth, fold it in half until it's the size of your hand, and then fold it in half and in half again, like I said, till you get eight sides. Then you wanna clean to dirty, high to low, um, you want to make sure that your surfaces stay wet for the allotted contact time. I don't have much in here today about contact time, but that's super important. Your um, surface needs to stay wet, wet for that entire time 
that is recommended on your um, disinfectant that you're using. So if it doesn't stay wet for, if your contact time is three minutes and your surface is dry in two, you need to re-wet it. It's, it's not enough. Most people need to use more than one if you have the Sani wipes or the um, disinfectant wipes. Don't use just one wipe. It's going to be dry before that contact time. Um, rotate and use unfold the cloth till you use eight sides. Once you use eight sides, you get a clean cloth. And then you never put that rag back into your um, cleaning solution. So you don't ever want to re-wet that. So make sure you have plenty of rags with you. The CDC recommends changing um, the floor mopping solutions every um, three rooms and at least every 60 minutes, if it's longer. Um, guess you can kind of read this for yourself. A disinfectant must be used to clean floors in critical areas or isolation rooms. So normal rooms that just that aren't that someone isn't in isolation they maybe don't have to be disinfected they have to be cleaned but not disinfected but if it is in isolation you have to have a disinfectant you never want to leave soiled mop heads in or cleaning cloths in soaking in buckets um, cleaning again high to low i know i preach that but if you take nothing away i hope you go away today thinking high to low um, clean to dirty. Same uh, goes with dusting. You want to dust high to low so that anything falls to the floor. So when you clean the floor last, you can pick all that up. Feather dusting is not really recommended anymore. So try to avoid that. If you're using feather dusters, we want to get rid of those. Always use approved disinfectants. Follow the manufacturer guidelines. Don't add more or less. Um, more actually makes um, a residue. So just keep that in mind. Um, one person told me uh, that she adds a little bit of a, something smelly to make the cleaning solution smell better. That is not acceptable. Um, please be watching your staff if you're a manager that they're not doing that. Always change gloves um, between rooms. Rule of thumb, if you are wondering if you should change your gloves, change your gloves. This is an example of a um, environmental service worker cleaning a room. So they have, you can see out there, they have the portable co uh, carts that they transport their supplies in. So clean items are on there, toilet paper, paper towels, they should be stored above the cleaning chemicals. Um, soil dusters or mopper, mops should be placed in a plastic bag and stored away from the cleaning, I, clean items. So often the bag, as you can see, is hung on the outside of the cart for transport. The mop handles, poles, and wet floor signs should be wiped with a disinfectant before placing them on the cart. I don't think we probably always do that. Um, so that's just a good reminder. Carts should be cleaned, and um, especially if they're visibly soiled, but they should be cleaned routinely anyway. Staff should not have any personal care items like their purses or snacks or drinks on those carts at all. I like this slide, it's something I never thought of, but they don't recommend that you store anything in these exam tables and these first couple uh, drawers. Things when you do exam of a patient can drip down in there and they most likely don't get cleaned. So something to think about with that. Glucometers and nebulizers. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about these. Just remember, super important, you have to use a barrier when you're going to do these procedures. You must use a barrier um, when you're setting these up. Um, you sh make sure you know your policy. You know, if you, if the overbed table, you're getting ready to do a treatment and the overbed table is full of a lot of stuff on there, don't set it on the bed. If you would have to use a bed, uh, make sure you have a barrier down a chucks or a paper towel, something. Have to use a barrier. Um, 
you're going to get dinged in a survey if you do not use a barrier. And I know it sounds easy, but we often don't do it. This picture, I just wanted to really get your attention to think about cross-contamination and things that we do in facilities. Um, this, um, these are just many, a few of the many ways that infections are transmitted or could be. So think about all the hands that touch those handrails. Think about how many times we're looking and scanning those name, bag, name bands. Um, we have charts on the bed. Where do we store those? Um, we have um, things that we carry in the bed, like our SC SCDs and ice machines for ortho procedures. Um, we carry a lot of things on the sides of those beds when we're transferring patients. So think about that and how you can reduce putting that. I kind of cringe actually at this chart on, on the bed because it probably went from the countertop um, of wherever they were having their procedure done to having hands touch it and then probably went right back to this patient bed without giving it any thought. <clears throat> Something else to consider is, um, like I said, we don't want to store anything on the floor if we don't have to. Um, most common pathogens on the floor are MRSA and C. difficile. Other things that are really highly contaminated are remote controls, door handles, light switches. Water bugs. We don't think about this too often, but just um, We'll quickly go through this. One way that we can prevent Pseudomonas um, and Legionella is to control the water temperature in facilities. These water bugs, as they are called, they can cause disease indirectly by inhaling aerosols through the shower. Um, so if you're doing construction, you really need to be aware and be involved in that process. Um, faucets and sinks. Again, we, like I said earlier, we have a lot of older facilities that might have um, older plumbing. Those dead legs on your plumbing, plumbing need to be capped off. It's just where biofilm, biofilm can build up. Um, you'll see the picture of the tomato up there. Um, Pseudomonas grows in tomatoes. So if you see a tomato that has spots like that, I wouldn't recommend that you eat that. I would throw that out and just get a new tomato. Ice machines can carry um, a lot of waterborne um, illnesses, so make sure that those are getting cleaned routinely. Our storage units, this is something that I really would encourage you after the presentation to go look at your own. Um, we don't want to store anything above, um, well, on a couple slides here, I'll show you how this is. We don't want these cardboard boxes. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about this here in a second. So if this is what your storeroom looks like, we need to rethink that. We don't want cardboard boxes. And the reason we don't want that is we have no control over how these boxes are transported to your facility or where they have been. Think about the back of the truck where they have been sitting. Little critters can get in those little crevices in the cardboard boxes and hide, and then they come into your facility. This is what I was talking about earlier, um, how you want your storage units to be. OSHA recommends 18 inches from the ceiling if you have a sprinkler head so that they are, the water can be evenly distributed. If you do not have a sprinkler system where your storage is, you can um, go five inches from the ceiling. And, you know, if people don't remember this, just draw a line, paint a line on the ceiling where they can't go past. So nothing above that line can be stored there. The requirements also state that supplies need to be eight inches from the floor and two inches away from the wall. When we talk about laundry, uh, we'll go through this pretty quickly. Make sure you're using rubber gloves. Um, never carry soil linen against your body. You need to ro roll it up. Um, don't shake linen. 
Um, Most of that's pretty self-explanatory. If you have, um, make sure you have your laundry carts covered at all times. You can review that on your own for the sake of time. Every patient should have their own personal care items. We talked a little bit about this. I know that budget is tight in most situations, but it is important that each resident have their own personal care items and that you don't share items. It's not a good idea uh, for the risk of cross-contamination of infections. If nail clippers are shared, um, there are new recommendations from APIC and they are to be sterilized. That's the only way to really know that they are clean. And APIC does have a new, ish, um, new uh, issue brief out and I can put that in the um, chat if anybody wants that later or in the references. So, and that goes into what's um, considered critical and non-critical items. So very important and worth the read. Okay, these are just a few pictures of places I wanted you to be aware, aware of in both our facilities, in our public places that we visit and in our homes. If you can flush the toilet with the lid down, that is best to avoid splashing and having the water splash outside. Don't leave toilet paper on the floor and try not to do your business on the toilet. The toilet is for going to the restroom, not reading the paper or scrolling um, through social media or answering a text. Do your business and get out of there. A lot of E. coli in these pictures, I would assume, or potentially. Some other things in your homes to think about is, um, and in your facilities are, goes back to personal care items. Toothbrushes are very dirty. And how many times, um, you know, we oftentimes don't get a new toothbrush regularly. We should do that. And then definitely don't store them all together with the rest of your families. Our kitchen sinks also very dirty place in our homes. When we clean our sinks, we tend to clean the drain area first and scrub it and then wash and make sure everything's nice and clean. But the principle is the same, top to bottom. Makes total sense if you think about it. Uh, what do I put on first? This is kind of basic 101, um, gown, mask, face shield, gloves. Gown, mask, face shield, gloves. That's what you put on first. What do you take off first? Gloves, take gloves off first. They're dirty. Face shield, gown, wash your hands, mask, and wash your hands again. Remember the principles of taking off our gloves. We wanna put one finger inside of the, the one glove and then wrap them together. Um, when you're taking off your gown, make sure that you're rolling it away from your body. I'm not gonna spend time on that. Those are basic principles that we should know. Um, we could do another webinar if somebody wanted more in depth on that, but what else can you do? Practice hand hygiene at every opportunity. Um, teach patients to ask their healthcare workers to clean their hands before they're being examined or before procedures are done. Um, have patients wash their hands before and after eating, after using the toilet, um, and educate your patients and families on proper precautions to do at home. This is everybody's job. Staff are the key to breaking the chain of infection um, and preventing pathogens. So good hygiene, glove use, cleaning the resident rooms, disinfecting surfaces, all so, so very important. I'm gonna talk briefly on project first line. I know we're getting really short on time, so I'm gonna try to whip through this here. Um, project first line, hopefully you've heard of it, is a national training initiative from the CDC that's being rolled out across the nation uh, to stop the spread of infectious diseases including COVID-19. Their thought is that everybody um, needs a basic foundational understanding of infection prevention and control, and that we use it each and every day. So in South Dakota, we did a survey and our survey results show that people wanted more education in these areas. I'm not gonna go through that for the sake of time, but one of the reasons we're doing today's talk is strategies to put infection control into place. 
So South Dakota, um, we have developed, um, well, we haven't developed, the CDC developed um, some great videos for everyone to watch on infection control. We developed a South Dakota Project for Sign webpage. This is our new logo we're happy to share. And we have a QR code that um, will take you directly there. So most of the times in a webinar, you would say, put your phones away. But for today, I want you to get your phone out, turn your camera on. If you've never done a QR code, um, just turn your camera on and put it up to that QR code and it should take you, and then you click the link, it'll take you right to South Dakota Project First Line. When you do that, it will take you to the training module. And the trainings are, um, there's many different videos there on different topics. Um, please feel free to utilize this for your staff or yourselves. Um, family members can take these trainings. They're great, they're easy to understand. They're great review. Um, for the sake of time, I wanted to talk a little more about that, but I wanted to make sure that you know you can download this QR code and it can be at your fingertips anytime you want. These are ICARs um, that we have available in South Dakota. So if you are a long-term care or an assisted living, you can get a free ICAR done. This is an infection control uh, risk assessment done by Dr. Um, Keegan and Randy Mason. They are infectious disease um, professionals and this is non-regulatory, so it is strictly just for your knowledge to improve the um, infection transmission uh, or infection program at your facility. So far we've had 35 assisted livings that have signed up for it and 52 long-term care. This is still available, it's free. Um, we just need a couple hours of your time and we're happy to do that. You can contact Leah Bonsberger at statesd.us or Kip Stahl or myself and we can get you hooked up with that. This is our partners in North Dakota. They have trainings for Project First Line as well. So check them out. Really every state has Project First Line so they all do something just a little bit different. This is our team at South Dakota Project First Line. We welcome Jess Danko and Diane Eide. Um, they're new to our team and we're happy to have them. Uh, there is another education that I wanted to make sure that you're aware of. It's from SPICE and Lori has said she would put that in the chat. Um, it's called Infection Control and Long-Term Care. It's free, it is April 4th through the 6th. I did sign up for that and I encourage you to do that as well. Um, I think that is about it. If anybody is interested in South Dakota, we are in the process of forming a South Dakota APIC chapter. Um, we have had one meeting so far and our next one is scheduled for March 2nd at 2 p.m. We are looking for anyone working in infection control that wants to be a part of this. Please, please let me know and we'll get you signed up and I'll get you the meeting link. So. Uh, with that, thank you guys for everything that you do in infection control. Um, I know I talked a long time. I know it was long. Hopefully you found something useful um, that you can take back. Thank you, Sherry. This is Carrie McDermott again with Great Plains Clan. On behalf of our organization, I want to thank Sherry Fast for her knowledge, her expertise, and everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis to um, help with infection control, training, education, meeting needs of those in our state. Um, and beyond. So thank you. Uh, we're, we probably don't have time for questions. Um, I do, I do um, want to make sure that if you have questions that you can get those to um, us at Great Plains Clan and we will pass along to um, Sherry. I do have one comment that North Dakota APIC also includes South Dakota, so please consider all our welcome. Um, and that came from an attendee, Susan Kringley. Um, and then I guess as we close out of today's session, I know Sherry has another um, appointment at three, so I'll make this quick. Uh, we will uh, provide you with an evaluation as soon as this webinar concludes. Please take a minute um, and provide us your feedback. Uh, we had over 200 and I think 35 people registered for today's training, so this topic is um, obviously 
relevant and applicable. So we are going to consider offering additional trainings in the future on this topic. Uh, I will be emailing all of you a certificate of participation that you can submit to your accrediting bodies for um, potential CE credit. Uh, Great Plains Quinn is an approved provider of CE with the North Dakota Board of Examiners for nursing home administrators, as well as the South Dakota Board of Nursing Facility Administrators. Um, again, thank you for your time, your attention. Um, we know you are very, very busy. Um, this topic is worthwhile and Sherry, thanks again for sharing your um, knowledge with all of us today. We greatly appreciate it. All right, in the recording and um, the presentation will be shared with all um, attendees uh, sometime yet this week via email, so thank you. Have a great day.